Since the ancient creation of dragons, it's common that a lot of fictitious beasts are given lavish breath attacks. Typically fire, but sometimes acid, water, poison, or others. Most inexplicable being cold. Whilst often being magical and rooted in fantasy, these are still prevalent in Spec Evo and other more grounded fiction. And there is some basis for this as animals will use what could be considered breath attacks. So what are these? What are they for? How could they be developed further if possible? What trends can be noted and how do they gel with fictitious examples? To start with perhaps the most grounded and least fanciful example, we'll begin with spitting venom. This is most prevalently seen in the widespread Naja genus, or the true cobras, with 17 of the 38 having the ability to spit venom, a bit under half of them, and then the unrelated wrinkles as well. And it's worth noting the spitting isn't at random. With both the mechanics of the action and the composition of the venom, spitting cobra venom is deliberately engineered to cause as much pain as possible, specifically targeting sensory neurons to do so. And speaking of specific targeting, the snakes also aim for the face with surprising accuracy, and especially at a moving human face. They also undulate the head to try and make sure the venom covers as big an area as possible to ensure hitting the eyes. So overall, it is worth noting this isn't just a last-ditch hack job to fire the toxins your body makes at attackers. It's undergone multiple levels of specific evolutionary divergence. There is some further divergence among the spitters themselves too. Some fire it in straight jets, whereas others spray it in a pressurised mist. Whilst the spitters do generally aim for the eyes, in some cases hypersensitivity in humans can make them very vulnerable to the venom mist as well. It could also be relevant to suggest there is some considerable evidence in spitting cobras that this ability was brought on from the specific threat of hominids too, though it will seemingly be used against other species as well. There's no shortage of venom spitters in fiction, and Monster Hunter has a pretty broad array of them with a variety of uses and ways of spitting. Whilst Gypsaros and Pukey Pukey both use their toxins for defence, in a typical, albeit less refined way than Cobras, a trope sometimes seen with this, that Iodrome and Great Roggy provide example of, is using it like a snake to kill large prey with less risk to yourself, albeit via a ranged attack rather than a strike. This is interesting. Not really seen in our own world due to the fact most toxins produced are liquid, and the skin provides a watertight barrier for the most part. But both do have their origins in wetland environments, seemingly. And it could be that this stems from prey with partially permeable skin, that would allow this rather than you having to break the skin yourself with a bite. All of the above, including cobras, would be technically counted as toxingens too. Specific toxins made to be put in contact with the surface of the body rather than injected via fang. Finally, it could be worth noting Camellios has his aerosolized spray of venom. It's questionable how effective an area of effect would be at an anti-predator defense. Although Camellios is perhaps the most sedentary old world elder, so it may work. Or similarly, with a diet at least partially made up of insects vulnerable to such toxins, Camellios may use it to smoke out large numbers of them at once, for easy consumption. Other liquids that can be sprayed include good old-fashioned water. The archer fish are perhaps the best example of this. And again, this isn't just gobbing off at random, but comes with a number of specialisations. Archerfish can actually adjust to the amount of power a jet has, depending on the size of their target, and when aiming, have to account for the refraction in the surface of the water to actually hit their targets. Such jets can also be used underwater to unearth hidden prey too. The jets themselves are effectively made with more advanced actions that we may use to spit water with them closing the gills and then arranging the tongue and the mouth to create pressure forcing the water out. Unlike Venom, it could be worth noting that this is a typically much more predatory usage, and this does seem perhaps reflected in fictitious animals too. Plesioth presumably uses it in the same way in Monster Hunter, possibly for smaller prey, and Mizutsune as well possibly. Anything that swims or burrows in any medium has the decadent luxury of not having to create its own fuel, and can simply borrow it from the substrate of its choice for such assaults. So sand, earth, snow, or molten rock swimmers can all use this with relative ease. 
Some, like the Scaldron from How to Train Your Dragon, use the more arduous task of scooping out water, heating it, then storing it in a pelican-like pouch to be dumped on things it doesn't like. One of the most popular methods nowadays, as some people often seek to ground their dragons and other blast breathers in reality, is through the mixing of different chemicals that then combust. The head honcho of inspiration here is of course the bombardier beetle family, well known for their explosive defensive mechanism spraying boiling water, oxygen, hydrogen peroxide, and cytotoxic quinones at attackers. This is done fairly simply. In one compartment is the hydroquinones and hydrogen peroxide, and in the other, catalases and peroxidizes, and never the twain shall meet. Except for when the beetle decides otherwise, squeezing them into a reaction chamber that liberates the oxygen from the hydrogen peroxide, oxidizing the hydroquinones to quinones and creating pressure to spray it all out at up to 100 degrees, and at surprising distances with fair accuracy too. All in all, not something you want going on near your face. So it's always something of a surprise when people insist on putting the reaction right next to said face. The Future is Wild's Spitfire Bird is the guiltiest of this, and generally serves as a fair fictitious example. As a highly derived prosolariform, more on them later, it fires chemicals it gets from flowers out of its tube nose. Even if the tube nose forms an effective gun barrel, you only have to look at slow-mo or frozen shots of bombardier beetles to see how messy this reaction can be. This is not something you want happening right next to your eyes. The excellent Reign of Fire dragons also qualify for this example, and are perhaps the most popular Hollywood example. Indeed, since their debut, it's not uncommon to see dragons with clear gland openings, or two jets creating the flame, even if the origin of said flame is never explained or explored. The dragons were specifically designed to have two glands that when the chemicals mix, they set alight, not only leading to fire breath, but also the visual feast of them dribbling fire as well with this being based on a mix of spitting cobras and bombardier beetles as one would expect. The two jets also meet a good few feet in front of the dragon, which makes good sense so that even if they are partially immune to their own fire, the sensitive sensory organs and facial tissues also aren't roasted. Some variations of assorted breath attacks are often corrosive in some way, generally implied to be some variety of acid, and in a way this is the most achievable of all that most things can replicate simply by upending their stomach contents over someone and dousing them in acid. Whilst a good few handfuls of birds will utilise this trick, some take it to a whole new level, and the fulmar is perhaps the best example. Prosolariforms generally, the tube-nosed seabirds, have certain stomach oils that come from having such a lipid-rich diet of oily fish, that they may regurgitate if pressed. The fulmar oil is exceptionally sticky and smelly, and when they hit the feathers of another bird, they mat them together and rob them of their waterproofing. Birds that get sufficiently oiled often can't fly or swim, and are often much more vulnerable to weather conditions, and even large predators like sea eagles have met their end this way. So this provides a basis for breath attacks in different ways. One as an example of a high-energy fluid that's expelled as a defense, that with modifications could well be turned into a fire or other such fanciful energy weapon if needed, and indeed fulmars were often used for fuel by sailors, and two, as an equivalent method for how a breath attack would arise in the first place evolutionarily, for sessile young to defend themselves whilst the parents were away. Monster Hunter's Kurapiko spits a form of bile, that could well have similar origins and composition to fulmar oil, with Kurapiko also taking design cues from some seabirds too. Other creatures have used acid in some way to defend themselves. Pacific Rim's Atachi has a pretty powerful luminous corrosion spray, and the xenomorphs will occasionally spit acid at enemies too. Considering their blood is acid, they seem aware of its ability, and it seems separate to their profusely made saliva. It may be they have some mechanism to secrete blood into the mouths for a defensive or offensive purpose but the Fulmars do show something of a weak trend in breath attacks real and fictitious, and that's that they're not cheap. The Prosolariforms in general have very fatty, energy-rich diets with the fish they eat, and as well as being oil-spewing, the chicks themselves are often very fat too. The Tubnose family engage in nestling obesity, 
feeding their chicks to up to 140% of adult weight, that results in them often looking like feathery puddles. Whilst this does help buffer the chicks against long gaps between feeding periods, the chief reason to load them up with calories is for when parental investment declines at the end of the nesting period, and then the chicks fledge. Unlike many other birds, they receive much less help once they've left the nest for good. Other species may partially overfeed chicks as well, but only rarely to the extent of the Procellariforms, and few have such an energy-rich diet. The defence of literally spewing an energy-rich fuel can only come from such well-fed babies on such a high-calorie diet. Snakes would rather not strike you if they can help it, and this is why cobras and the spitting cobras in them will vocalise, rear, and use their hoods before striking, and why snakes sometimes give dry bites too. Venom is a protein, and they'd ideally not waste it at all if possible. Once things have fully kicked off, cobras will and can spray a lot. But for sufficient harassment to have got them to this stage in the experiments, the snakes likely believed their lives to be in danger, in which case regenerating protein is the lesser of two evils compared to being killed. This trend is somewhat present in fiction too to an extent. Monster hunters assorted beasts will fail to make their breath attacks when their stamina runs low, showing this isn't just an inexhaustible supply. The Red Death in How to Train Your Dragon had the most impressive incendiary ability of any dragon, and may have only achieved this from the fact that much like a Fulmar chick, it was fed near constantly by its hypnotised subordinates, which it also occasionally ate, not only supporting its huge size, but supplying it with the fuel necessary for near unlimited fire breath. The bull dragon in Reign of Fire regularly ate the most nutritious thing around, its own harem, whereas the smaller females apparently ate ash, and consumed humans and apparently their food as well. Clearly quite a disparity in diet, and a deleted scene seems to have had the main characters visit the bull's plucking post to see the considerable remains of other female dragons. Otachi was a selectively bred, genetically engineered bioweapon, that thus wasn't bound to natural selection but whatever goals the alien race wanted her to fulfil. Whatever the origin point of her gigantic acid weapon was, may be considerably more modest in the base species. So overall, fanciful breath attacks can't just be whipped out of nowhere in more grounded and slash or non-magical fantasy. They need a fair source of fuel that presumably requires either selection in diet for the fuels, or gives such creatures considerably higher feeding requirements than non-breath attack using ones. How expensive such a weapon may be is hard to say. Giant reptiles themselves, in the form of giant theropods, may have only been as expensive to feed as the largest mammalian carnivores a fraction of their weight, even if we add both the costs of takeoff and landing, assuming they fly, and fueling some form of breath attack too, and it may be possible that such creatures should be able to meet most of their requirements with a good source of similarly sized prey. But again, this could at least be partially bucked by having your creature be a swimmer of any variety, and just using the substrate it swims in. To actually start ruining the fun in earnest now, much like many other beloved creature design tropes designed to make something more badass, breath attacks in actual nature are far more often than not for defence. Only the archerfish bucks this trend here in that it uses it for predation. In all the other examples, spraying something painful at something else is used to keep it away, rather than bring it down. And it's on this note it's worth asking what your creature in any respect is using its breath for. Because to use fire as an example, it's a horrifically inefficient way to kill. Unless you're going for insanely hot fantasy level fires that melt stone and such, even third and fourth degree burns are rarely fatal, and if they are, they typically take days to kill. Things killed by fire tend to die from smoke inhalation or oxygen starvation, and even the most truly unbelievable burns won't be swiftly fatal, unless you're quite literally cooked to death over a prolonged period. So too does this account for just about any type of breath attack too. Just as a lot of popular media shows lava as slightly hot water you can stand next to with no problem, popular media osmosis into public consciousness really understates how difficult it is to burn, freeze, melt, or whatever something that's alive, and has walls on walls of living cells to get through. All in all, nothing that wants to bring something down that it wants to eat as soon as possible would use a breath attack to get it. 
unless it was a similar case to archerfish and that it was a step almost akin to tool use to then access the prey itself. But it could be worth noting defense is a perfectly respectable use for breath attacks anyway. If it's good enough for nature, it's good enough for you. It just won't make as much sense in a Megadeth King Lord Apex Predator. But if needs must, it could always be that it's a vestigial trait left over from juvenile phases, that it used much as a Fulmar chick does. A lot of the time in media and with dragons especially, the fuel seems to have something of a gassy appearance rather than an ignited liquid fuel. This is often the most popular way it's done in fantasy, with no real visible source lending more credence to it being a gas. And this may seem like an obvious point that was missed earlier, but it's worth noting that a gas might be the least probable method of a breath attack. Gas takes up a lot of room if you want to have a lot of it, or you can pressurise it, and that's both hard for a living thing to do at a meaningful level, and dangerous too. One, having a container of bone or muscular valves strong enough to hold pressurised gas would take a lot. And two, even if it isn't as fanciful as an explosion, damage to the container would result in massive air embolisms in the creature's tissues, that if not fatal would be certain agony. Alternatively, you can just lump the fact that a lot of room is needed, and have very large, rotund-bodied creatures with the necessary gas and fermentation chambers like assorted ungulates. Another possible option is something like a fish swim bladder, that can draw certain gases from the blood into a sac, that in this case can then be weaponized if necessary at the cost of presumably having to hyperventilate to restore said gases, or to eat more of whatever mineral they're derived from. One of the more deliberately awkward breath attacks using gases comes in Terry Pratchett's Swamp Dragons, a far cry from the more typical dragons called the Noble Dragons. They're small, a bit useless, and eat just about anything to try and improve their fire-breathing abilities, with the ability to rearrange their digestive systems for the same purpose. They're not very good at such things, and can sometimes explode as a result, or as a result of certain behavioural stimuli. All in all, not a great time. But then of course Discworld is a fantasy, and it's worth noting the whole thing of fire breathing in fiction does come from fantasy, and firstly from myth and heraldry. Many such creatures weren't meant to be viewed as species, rather as gods or their familial extensions, or aberrations of the earth for narrative devices. So there was no concern with how they did what so long as they did it in a way that suited the story. The persistent cultural love of fire-breathing monsters that led them being brought into fictional properties, where they are now species, more akin to our knowledge of biotic life, now has to do the hard legwork of explaining the fact they're so often deliberately overdesigned by their very nature. Western dragons often have impressive horns, powerful jaws, eagle-like talons, whip, clubbed or spiked tails, and then some form of breath attack too far more lethal weapons than they could ever possibly need, so it's much more impressive when the knight slays them, rather than trying to say anything about the influences sexual selection may have on them. Pure fantasy dragons still and likely will always persist, and present a design luxury in that they don't have to be explained, but a design challenge in asking what you're going to do to make them worth watching that their past 50 incarnations haven't. In nature and speculative biology, it's clear breath attacks do and can exist, but as with many other things, they may require something of a shift in use or user for those who wish for the creatures they make to cut as close to the bone of reality as possible. Thanks for watching, and especially to patrons Phenomenon, The Super Stuper, Sonam Lobsong, K Sandom, Big Al, Eringar Steini, Flygon's Archives, Hui Hui, Original Username, Inventory Overflow, Tristan Berry, Evely, Howleth, Archzor Queen, Seth Fake Last Name, Zaysir, Dodekablos, and Bazugazu Bachohatsu Bachomatsu for their ongoing generosity keeping the channel going. A link is provided in the description if you want to join up, and any amount is always appreciated. Please do consider liking and subscribing too. These videos often seem to do fairly well, so why not consider joining up and adding your own suggestions? Of course, some topics are too far removed to be discussed, or are out of my wheelhouse, but this video and the one prior to it were both suggested by the comments, so by all means do chip in a comment and it may well result in a later video. This one probably leans a bit more on the grounded fantasy side than Spec Evo, 
But then there is heavy overlap between people making their own dragons, or other creatures, with fantastical or mythological roots, and with Spec Evo most of the time anyway. Again, I'm unsure what the next video will be. I made this one due to it being the next topic in the lineup, and I knew I didn't want to throw out another Monster Hunter related video in the tidal surge of reaction and analysis videos to the trailer for Monster Hunter 6. Not that we'll be calling it as such anymore on the release of this video but I do plan to keep content coming semi-regularly as usual, and I can only hope you'll continue to watch it.